Okay, we are live. Hi there, everyone, and welcome. I'm Angela Fair. My goal here on my channel is to help you become your own favorite artist, offering watercolor techniques and tips to help you, and a reminder that it is the heart that brings life to your art. So we're here to paint uh, in a way that works for you, something that thrills and inspires you, uh, and creates a sustainable creative practice. Now today I'm not going to be doing a painting demonstration for you, but uh, I was looking at my studio and thinking I really need to clean this place. And uh, because I, I get new products all the time, I love art supplies, I'm a bit of an art supply junkie, of course, um, because often trying new materials, new supplies helps to break me out of a rut and get excited about watercolor again. Creativity for me is birthed in surprise, and so I need to do unexpected things, try unexpected colors, make unexpected marks in order to feel inspired and like I'm making authentic work. And uh, so I do tend to accumulate materials. I also get sent products to try from different manufacturers, and that's definitely a perk of having a YouTube channel uh, that's been around as long as mine has. Uh, I just want to thank you for being here, first of all. Um, this is just a fun little live stream where I'm going to show you uh, what I have uh, accumulated in the studio lately. Some of these are supplies I'm using on the regular, and others are things that um, are probably aren't going to be a regular part of my creative practice, but I love figuring out ways to use them in uh, unexpected ways or to make them work for me or passing them on to uh, maybe an art artist friend who might find more use for them. Uh, so let's take a look at what I have here on my, my work surface. There's a bunch of stuff here, and we're just gonna go through it a little bit. And if there's a product that resonates for you, something that makes you excited to, to use, uh, I've got links in the description below the video to help you source them. Um, many of the links are uh, in the US um, because most of my viewers are in the US. So if you're in Europe or Canada, sometimes you have to do a little bit more research uh, to find um, to find those supplies or elsewhere in the world, Australia. I know for Canada, where I am, uh, often we end up paying a lot of shipping uh, and duty if we have to order across the border, so that can be a challenge. And um, okay, so let's just take a look at what we have here. First of all, I wanna show you these. Not all of the products I'm gonna be sharing are new. Um, but they're things that I've been using lately. Um, these are the Schmincke granulating limited edition colors. Um, Schmincke has um, come out with these, I, I think relatively recently. Um, they call them a limited edition. And on the tube, you'll see there's a G down below here. Um, and they've made several series of these granulating colors. They're combinations of pigments. Um, and if you uh, like to nerd out on pigment science, uh, you are not at the right place because I like to see how a paint's gonna work. Um, and I don't worry so much about the different pigments it, it's made of. Um, we do know that pigment has different weights. Um, so that's gonna cause it to settle into the paper or float on top of a wash. Um, they have different um, gran granule sizes as well, and they react differently in water. So um, that's what gives us these different um, textures in the pigments. And this little piece of paper right here underneath is actually one color. This, I believe, is the Schmincke Deep Sea Violet. And um, so you can see there's actually this really beautiful indigo color and then kind of an earthier reddish brown that kind of um, sits underneath. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And that's why I like these granulating hues. Um, these I've been stocking up and buying them myself. Uh, they're not something that's been provided to me. Um, they come in, I just wanted to point out, they come in about, I think, four different, five, four or five different um, lines. We have the Forest series. So this is Forest Olive, and they're more of an earthy tone, um, greenish, greens and browns and so forth. Um, we have the Tundra series, which is cooler colors. This is Tundra Blue. Um, we have the Glacier series. This is Glacier Black. And we have the Deep Sea series, and this is Deep Sea Violet. And I just want to point that out because when you're searching for these, they can be hard to find. Um, <laughs> what I've noticed is if you search up the Deep Sea um, colors, that will give you the granulating set, um, the Glacier series, the Tundra series, the Forest series, and there's a Galaxy series as well. So um, that's something you can look for when you look for those Schmincke um, granulating colors. If you're a fan of granulation like me, um, you can have a lot of fun with just one color and a little bit of water. 
Um, okay, so what else have I got in my studio that's been fun for me lately? Let's move over to this little pile. And these are pretty much brand new. I've barely had a chance to try them yet, um, but I'm so excited about these beautiful paints from Beam Paints. And I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. So Beam is um, actually a Canadian company um, out of Ontario, and it's indigenous owned. And these are so gorgeous. They're hand poured watercolor paints, um, and they wrap them in this little beeswax holder. Um, I'm hoping you can see that and it's tied off with a little strip of cloth. And then I, I also ordered, ordered the palette, which is um, this lovely wooden um, palette. So you could actually squeeze two paints into here. I've seen that done. Or I've just set in my little beeswax holders. Now these are their gouache um, paints. And to tell you the truth, I do not order um, hand poured paint very often because I like my paint moist from the tube but when I heard about this indigenous owned company I just had to try it and um, whenever you're working with the poured paints I'm just trying to find a scrap of paper that has um, some room for me to paint whenever you're working with poured paints and I don't even have a water container nearby because I really wasn't planning on painting today and this, uh, this is a ceramic palette that Beam also makes. Isn't it beautiful? Um, so when you're working with poured paints, you just have to work a little harder to get a rich saturation of pigment out because they're often quite firm in the palette. And because these are gouache, they're gonna be a little bit opaque and you can see that beautiful um, shade of pink is actually quite rich. And um, handmade paint to me is really special to use because you get to think about the intention of the maker behind it you think about the process that it goes through and the hands that it passes through before it comes to you and i really believe that makes uh, creates art with more connection um, this little palette is just the prettiest little thing and that's going to be parked over here beside my um, work surface for um, when I need to squeeze color fresh from the tube. I'll be going um, there to use it. So um, I see other, a couple comments of students, uh, watch, viewers who are using um, beam paints. Um, and if there's a hand, I, I wanted to bring this out because they are Canadian. Uh, so if you're outside of Canada, you know, it might be a little bit of a stretch for you to order. It's um, but you, I, I want to encourage you to support your local paint manufacturer. Um, there are so many artisans out there who are making these ha small batch hand poured pigments. And um, it's really fun to have them as a part of your creative practice. So thanks Beam Paints for those. Um, so those are some artisanal things. Actually, if we're talking artisanal products, um, I'm good. I have to bring out my Levinson paintbrush, um, which is this bamboo um, goat hair and synthetic blend um, handmade paintbrush. Now, Levinson paintbrushes, I start, I've been using them for about a year. Um, this brush I've used for, for the last year pretty much full time and um, love the shapes it makes. It's actually literally painted miles of paper at this point because um, I love the shape of this brush so much. And um, again, that, that beautiful, it has a feel of a magic wand really in my hand. So um, I love these lovens and paintbrushes. It's been well worth the investment and um, beautifully and thoughtfully made. The um, natural fibers in these brushes are actually um, upcycled. <laughs> they're, they're recycled from like uh, often what um, Tracy Levinson will do as he hand makes these brushes is he'll actually go to estate sales and he'll take um, like a fur coat and repurpose those furs into paintbrushes. Uh, and I think that's such a wonderful intentional way of um, honoring, <laughs> honoring those furs, honoring those fibers and creating these beautiful brushes with the natural hair. And he has a line of synthetic brushes as well. Uh, I have, there's a, there's a, Actually, I do have a discount code in the description below the video, so you can check that out. Now, as we are moving on, um, let's take a look now at some of the supplies I have from Kurataki. In my most recent video, and I've linked it in the description, um, I did a review of these Kurataki ink sticks. And you actually um, you may have already seen it. Uh, we these are uh, the ink sticks are here. I will open it. Um, beautiful pigment sticks and you grind these on an ink stone and I demonstrate how to do it I'm not going to do it today 
Um, this is the ink stone that I have. And so you grind these inks. It's a beautiful meditative process. And I like that idea of slowing down, grinding ink and thinking about your painting. Um, to me, that's a really wonderful way of kind of getting into the studio and making that intentional process. So you can find out more about the ink sticks in the video um, dedicated to those. But I wanted to show you some of the other things that Kurotaki has sent me um, because I won't be doing a video specifically for them. Uh, I decided just to share the video of the item I was the most excited about. So they also had sent me their Clean Color Real Brush markers, um, which really do have a brush tip like a... Uh, paintbrush but very very fine very small tip and there's 90 markers in this set so tons of colors and I experimented with those I used them to color a stamp and then stamp that onto watercolor paper um, and then I used them to draw and then spray with water to soften and then drew line again to create some detail and shape and then I used them on um, oh, I use them in really brilliant saturation um, to create kind of this abstract, uh, which I had intended to uh, build a painting on top of. And then it ended up that those dye inks in the markers were so bright um, that I didn't feel like I wanted to build layers over top of them at all. So I do have to give you a plug for the brilliance of the, those markers. But um, I and I also use them here on Upo paper. And I wanted to show you this just because I'm a little bit sad about it. Um, when these sat out on my work surface here for um, a couple of weeks, and um, this one was on top and this one was underneath, and they're using basically the same colors. So I wanted to show you that because I really noticed that um, the top one faded so much in just such a short time um, on this Upo paper. And so um, I, as much as uh, I love the diversity of color of these Kurotaki markers, I, I was really disappointed to see how much they faded in a short time. So they're definitely a very impermanent way of um, painting or sketching. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. Not all reviews can be good reviews. Um, this is a, actually a little bit of the ink sticks when I was just beginning to test them out. And I see a question from Al Nelson, um, whether the ink sticks lift it all off the page. And I really found that they lock in on the paper really quite well. Um, just like most paint, if you have a thick layer of pigment, uh, it is gonna lift a bit. Um, but I do mention that in the video. Um, okay, so the last Kurotak, or actually I have a little bit more. Um, this little flower palette is from Kurotaki as well. And um, this I'm going to use a lot because palettes, <laughs> uh, anytime I'm squeezing out fresh color, I need something to put it in. Um, this also works really well if you're grinding those ink sticks and you want several different colors, you can pour it into this palette and have your variety of colors. And uh, so I love stashing um, these small porcelain palettes all over the studio um, when I need to squeeze fresh color. Um, I, now, you might be surprised that I didn't review the Gansai Tambi um, Kurotaki watercolors. Um, this is the 48 color set. But I really wasn't sure it suits the kind of watercolor artist that I am. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, it came with these brush pens, which you can fill with water, the water brushes. And uh, they're four different sizes. And I'm not an artist who uses water brush pens and I kind of feel like <laughs> in watercolor, you have artists who use water brushes and artists who don't. And I'm one of the artists who doesn't. Um, artists who do, um, I think often really like these Gansai Tambi sets. Um, they're a Japanese traditional watercolor is what I'm told. They have a little bit of opacity to them. So I tested out all the different, um, I, I swatched out all the colors and you can see them here. And, um, I thought there was a second, there is a second swatch inside the lid. So I swatched them out on both of those sheets of paper. And, um, and they're a little bit more opaque. They had a little bit of a chalky feel to me, which um, I'm not drawn to. Um, as a watercolor artist who uses tube papers, I'm huge about the tactile sensation of working with paint. 
when I'm working with paint that's been squeezed into my palette, um, just like I have here, um, I moisten this at the beginning of a painting session and it softens a bit. It has a bit of a squishy feel. And I, I have the ability to get a really thick saturation of, of paint. And I can tell by looking at these that there's a lot less paint in these little palettes. Um, and it's meant to be used in a much more diluted, transparent way. And um, with water brushes, that tends to be the way you don't want to pick up a blobs of pigment on a water brush because then you have to clean it off. And if you're using a water brush, you don't usually have water containers to rinse your brush in. Um, you use the water that's in the reservoir of the brush. So I just want to bring this out um, just to mention it. Um, there, If you're working in transparent, thin layers of color, um, smaller paintings, if you're, if you're that style of painter, um, these might be a much better fit for you than they were for me. But I do feel like I'm an artist who wants that um, rich pigment um, and to be able to control the dilution um, to quite a, quite a greater degree. Um, so I just wanted to bring uh, to mention that. Um, I love the, the rich colors that you see here. And um, I could see a smaller set like this being something that I might use for plein air, just for portability. Um, but again, I, I tend to draw, be drawn to the pigment tubes um, much more than the pans. It's just something I know about myself. Um, okay, uh, and now I have a question about, do they feel closer to watercolor than gouache? I would say they are more like watercolor with that slight bit of chalkiness. Okay, moving on to my stack. Um, it's hard to keep all this stuff organized. Let's talk about this book. It's right in front of us here. Um, this, uh, and then I'll talk about, I have two other books I wanna show you. Um, new to my library and my studio. I love watercolor books. Even one small piece of information can inspire you and help you to grow. And so I don't go to a watercolor book expecting to have my whole life transformed um, by the entire contents. I'm really satisfied if I just get a small piece of information to add to my knowledge. And uh, so this book, Creative, Creativity Through Nature by Anne Blockley, did not disappoint. I have read her, her books before. I know her style and love what she does. Um, I feel like we have a kinship in this intuitive painting that um, we both do. And uh, I love that she got a little deeper in this book than simply a tutorial. She's really talking about getting to the heart of why you paint, um, connecting with your environment, immersing yourself in nature. Um, here she's talking about responsible art making, um, using natural and handmade processes, and um, wanting to be intentional about every part of her creative process. And um, you know, here we've got a section where she's immersing herself in nature in the Bluebell Wood while she paints the Bluebell Wood and uh, makes me want to rush off to the UK so I can, I can do the same. We don't have um, bluebells here. Um, we have lungwort that look like bluebells and they're, they're lovely with a horrible name. So there you go. Um, this is uh, eco printing, which I've, I, I love doing in the fall. And uh, so we just see um, this immersion into nature that sparked her creativity. And to me, that encourages me where I'm at because I desire many of the same things. And I feel that, that kinship with Anne um, as she talks about her process and, uh, and I get to develop mine. Um, this is my other uh, new watercolor book. This is Ian Stewart's On Plein Air Light and Color. And um, this, uh, I, I've been wanting to do more plein air painting. I'm going to Italy in October to teach an art and sketching workshop. And there are just a few spaces left. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, you can visit my website at angelafair.com. And um, plein air painting is such a fascinating thing because you immerse yourself in the environment again, trying not to be distracted um, so that you can learn how to see and engage with your location. And um, each artist has to find the way to do it for them. Um, I feel like with plein air painting, it can feel very vulnerable because you're open to scrutiny often. And um, so I, I'm absorbing anything that can help me to develop my own plein air practice and be more confident in it. Making plein air work for me involves very much like Ian, um, bringing my own style into my environment and feeling safe to do that. And artists who are bold about that, um, Ian, you can see how interpretive his cover is here. Um, 
I really uh, like that he's open to uh, bringing his style into the environment, being a little bit um, or a lot expressive with loosening up um, outside of the areas he wants to focus on. And you can see how blurred it gets around the edges, um, which I love. Um, one more book I want to share with you, and this one was a gift. It, it appeared in my mailbox, and I have to thank my friend Caroline Ullman for sending this to me. And this is Charlie Maxey's book, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. This is not a book about watercolor, but it's a book that uses watercolor and ink. And Charlie became... Um, he, uh, what's the word? Um, he, he, he drew the public eye in uh, through COVID as he started to share these beautiful, encouraging um, sketches. This one says, what is the bravest thing you've ever said? Ask the boy and help, said the horse. So it's these lovely conversations um, designed to just kind of quiet your heart and encourage you. And I'm so glad I get to have a copy of it because I'd read Charlie Maxey's story, um, a little bit about him and what he does. Um, and I just was... Um, inspired and touched by it. Um, anytime you can connect with people um, and, and create such beautiful work. Um, yes, this is so, so encouraging. Uh, and so thank you, Caroline, for sending me that book. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. My daughter's been reading it and uh, I keep finding it in different spots in the house. Uh, I want to talk as well about World Watercolor Month. And I see questions about my brush, so I will um, re reference that in just a moment as well. Um, it's World Watercolor Month right now, <laughs> and uh, this is something I'm so happy to be a part of. Uh, I've been a part of World Watercolor Month since it first began, which I think was 2017. And uh, so this is my um, limited edition commemorative um, pouch. Um, I love the size of this because it makes a great plein air kit. Um, even my big Lebensen brush would fit inside so I can take it with me when I travel. And um, all of the proceeds from the World Watercolor Month souvenir shop go to the Child Art Foundation and um, support kids, uh, get, getting kids access to great art supplies and lessons um, and just resources for them. I believe in creativity for kids, um, encouraging, helping them to learn how to um, see their ideas come to life is really impactful for young people. It's impactful for us too. So um, yeah, so I just want to encourage you to um, take a look at the World Watercolor Month Souvenir Shop. I'm not the only artist who has a commemorative pouch there. They also have um, the World Watercolor Month um, mugs. This one is uh, from 2019 actually, and I'm still using it and spilling with it. And uh, and uh, yeah, just there's some, some great ways to support World Watercolor Month. We also have prompts that you can paint along with. And um, I, I, I've been posting on the World Watercolor Month blog every Friday. So um, yeah, just go ahead and check that out. Yeah, it's all wet now. Okay, um, brushes. I want to show you um, these brushes were sent to me and they are still in the package. I have not had the chance to try them yet. And I just want to talk a little bit about actually um, how to pick a brush. Um, these are made by Zen Art Supplies. This is the Black Tulip Mix Shapes for Watercolors. They're a faux squirrel synthetic brush is what I'm told here. Um, and we're just going to shake them out so we can take a look. Now I have to confess that I have a lot of paint brushes but it hasn't always been the case. When I first started painting I had a round brush, I had a flat brush, um, and that was, I think I had a rigger brush, but I never used it, so that was about it. And even today, for 90% of my painting, I'm working with my Lebensen um, Goat Synthetic 1.5 inch bamboo handle brush. Um, that's the long name. Uh, I do have it linked up in the description below the video so that you don't have to remember the name. You can just click on the link and uh, go check it out. Now, um, regarding synthetic brushes, I really... I'm not opposed to a synthetic brush, but we ha we see some differences between synthetic and natural hair brushes. And if I'd been smart, I would have had a cup of water here that we can demonstrate with. We do have a cup of water. We'll just use my drinking water today. And I'll wash my cup after. I think it's overdue for that anyhow. So this is a natural hair brush. This is a Kalinsky Sable. And um, when I get it wet, it has this wonderful poofy shape. This is a number 12. And um, you can see how full it gets. Now this is a um, Princeton number 12. 
and it's a little dirty actually. And when I get it wet, you can see we don't have the same kind of puff to it. It doesn't hold as much water. Um, it doesn't, those fibers just don't hold water in the same way. Synthetic um, fibers don't have the tiny little scales that natural hair does. And so we have a different water capacity. Um, what you're going to do, if you're an artist who prefers to use non-animal products, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to adapt your painting method to compensate for the brush that you have. So if you're working with natural hair, hair brushes, you understand how much water they hold and you're going to, you know, paint accordingly. And if you use synthetic brushes, you understand how much water they hold and how they feel in your hand and, and the kind of um, snap and shape they create. And you're going to paint according to that. Um, because uh, now I feel like I do get the best of both worlds with the Levinson brush because it is an ethically sourced um, fiber, <laughs> natural fiber. And so, uh, and this is a synthetic combination. So we have a bit of uh, synthetic uh, fiber in this as well. And I really love the carrying capacity, how much water in paint it holds and the shape it creates. Um, <laughs> uh, with now when it comes, synthetic fibers are the cheapest. So when you buy an, an inexpensive brush, you're going to be getting synthetic fibers, um, which is great if you have ethical concerns. Um, but <laughs> You also, um, there's some other factors to take into consideration. Um, the, the handmade process, and I should mention that this one is made by Rosemary and Company, and they are handmade brushes as well, um, made in the UK by um, some very lovely people. Rosemary makes these brushes. Um, that's why her name is on the label. Um, and so they're very thoughtfully made. And there's a quality control there that you don't always get with a cheaper brush. These brushes from Zenart, I googled it, they retail for about $25. And um, one of my favorite synthetic brushes from a Skoda, um, when I, if I get lucky and can get it on sale, um, I can also pay about $25. So I can get this one brush or I can get all six of these. Um, this is the brush I'm going to grab. Um, with these brushes, one of the six has a loose ferrule. When I, when I hold it, I can feel the shake um, that this isn't secure. And this is the second set they've sent me, and both of them have had loose ferrules um, in one of their brushes. So that's not ideal. Um, when these brushes are moistened, um, I don't see that swell <laughs> that doesn't puff up to hold water. And I also can feel a little stiffness to it. Um, I often feel like new painters, and I've talked about this before, um, I'm a little obsessed with brushes perhaps, um, I, I feel as though um, a synthetic brush, if you're a new painter, it gives you a little bit more control. You, have, uh, you can control the marks it makes. When you work with natural fibers, they're softer, you're going to get a squishier feel and a more organic stroke. And so um, just a reminder again, uh, when you're looking for a brush, I personally don't like to buy brushes that are in a package. And I'm sorry, Zenart, they sent me these brushes to try. I really wanted to like them, but it just comes down to when I see a set of brushes, first of all, I know I'm not going to use all the shapes. Um, although I am a little curious about what this cat's tongue sh um, will create. I'm looking forward to trying that. But I know I'm not going to use all of the brushes. I'd be better off spending the same amount of money for just the brushes that I would use um, or spending more money and getting a brush I'm going to know that I can use for an entire year or longer. And um, what happens with the, with the cheaper brushes as well is um, if the ferrule is loose, um, you're going to see water getting into the ferrule. It's going to make the handle swell. And then we have, uh, or, sh or swell and shrink, we get the, uh, we see the paint starting to peel off. Um, you know, it just doesn't last as long. So um, these I'll hang on to because I like teaching classes to kids um, and they can have some fun with these and abuse them a bit without me um, worrying about, um, you know, them ruining a value, valuable brush. Um, or I might use them for craft purposes where I want a brush that I can use um, rapidly with maybe a, a paint that might not rinse out perfectly if I'm painting with acrylic paint or something. So um, it's always nice to have a cheap, cheaper brushes on hand. But for my fine art paintings, I go to the, the more pricey brushes that I have a little bit more control over what I choose. 
And, um, and I also know that there's people behind these brushes that support their, their warranty. And the Levinson brushes have a lifetime guarantee. Can't beat that. Okay, I ranted on a little bit about that. I guess you know how passionate I am about brushes. Um, finally, I wanna show you the paper I've been using for the last, um, a, a little bit obsessively for the last uh, few months. And that's Hanamula's Watercolor Collection. And um, so this is the cover. <laughs> and I have here the rough and the cold pressed, um, 300 GSM or 140 pound blocks. Uh, a paper block means it's um, got adhesive on all four sides. Um, sometimes it's so cute, the newest painters will buy a block and they'll be like, I don't understand, I only got one piece of paper. And that's not the case. This is a stack of paper. It's got adhesive on all sides so that you can start painting right away. Um, rather than taping your paper down to keep it from buckling, they've just taken care of that for you. Once your painting is done, there's a little gap here, and I like to just slip a palette knife in between the sheets and cut it loose. Um, the Escoda brush I mentioned was synthetic. It's their Versatil line. So the Hanamulo, Hanamulo paper, one thing I always look for on paper is, is it 100% cotton? Why, yes, it is. 100% pure cotton rag. Paint flows better on 100% cotton. Um, and the texture of the Hanamula paper is lovely, but don't take my word for it. Let me show you some of the pa paintings I've made on this paper. And thank you to Hanamula for sending me um, this paper to use. I'm really enjoying the convenient size for one thing and just being able to grab a block and start painting. If you work on painting blocks um, like this, I would encourage you to have more than one because you're going to have a wet painting uh, that you need to dry before you remove it from the block. And so um, go ahead and have several so that you can keep painting when you um, when your painting is wet, you can grab a new block and keep uh, start something else. Um, these are just a few of the things I've painted. This one was painted plein air during the winter. There was a moose down below. I could hear him tromping through the bushes. Um, this was an experiment in capturing that glow of um, the backlit sunlight. Uh, I really feel like <laughs> the the Hanamula paper allows you to layer um, and it also has that lovely texture that I enjoy. So I've really found it easy to work with and I want to point that out here. Um, okay, so the so yeah, I've, I'm enjoying using this paper. Um, I like the versatility of the sizes. In fact, probably most of the paintings in my calendar for next year are going to have been painted on this paper. Um, it's the perfect size for calendar pages. Uh, now, last thing I want to share with you is something that I bought just for fun, just for me. It was kind of a, a splurge, and that's a subscription box. This is my first ever um, subscription box. Uh, I did order that one about granola one time, but this is my first art supply subscription box, and that's Paper Gang by Oh Dear. Um, and what's really fun about these is that every month when they arrive, um, there's a different graphic artist who's featured, um, there's, well, first of all, we have a different custom box every time. Here's two of them. And then they feature a different graphic artist that they hire to design the products inside. And um, so then the, all the art inside the box reflects the style of the artist. Now, I like this was a customizable, customizable birthday kit set. So we have, um, these are envelopes actually and a totally blank birthday card that I can decorate. I mean, it's perfect for an artist. Um, this is the leaflet that talks about um, the featured artists. This was actually a creative duo. The products inside and, oh, there's a little how-to on how to use it. Sometimes there's a poster in this little fold-out. It's just different things. And so it's really been fun just seeing what appears. There's usually some stickers um, a notepad or a notebook. This time it's a notepad, which I actually will probably use more than a notebook. Um, there's some gel pens, an ink pad, and the little stamps. And I'm a fan of stamps, so I'm going to have a lot of fun with this. And um, the Paper Gang um, products come out of the UK, so it comes a long way to get to me here in Canada. But it's been really fun to use. Probably I won't order more than a six-month subscription, which is what I have right now, just because I haven't used it yet the way I would like to have been too busy 
but it's been a lot of fun to um, have those little goodie packages come every every month and what i really should have done was ordered it on behalf of my daughters who would love this kind of thing so i might just have to kind of gift it on to them a little bit um okay so i've just shared um a little bit of what's new in my studio for products i can't believe i have all this great stuff to play with um, i don't always give it all justice and some of it i don't always like and um, that's okay you know i i know that if it doesn't fit me i can pass it on to someone else um, I can learn from it. And sometimes years down the road, I'll pull out a product that I've been kind of hoarding and I'll find a new way to use it that inspires and excites me. So I never just think, okay, I'm done. I'll never use this. Um, sometimes it's just in finding the right way or the right person to pass it on to. Um, again, there's links in the description below the video um, for all these products. And I'm just going to quickly answer any questions that are popping up. Um, I saw something about, um, can you paint on the back of the Hanamula paper? Um, I do most of the time. Um, lately, it's really weird. I have been, I've been finishing paintings in the first try and I don't have to paint on the back. Feeling kind of lucky about that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good, it, the texture on the back is slightly different, but I always feel like, you know, if I'm going to not have a painting turn out, I'm going to get as much mileage as I could out of that piece of paper, flip it over and use the back for a warm up or just paint on it. Um, any other questions? Let's see here. Yeah, okay, I'm wrapping up. I wanna thank you for being here. I, I just uh, thought it would be fun to show you what I've got and I didn't wanna do this whole um, really polished, curated um, look at what my supplies are. I, I, um, I just wanted to, yeah, if you were in my studio and we were hanging out, this is what I would be showing you. Uh, so you get to see it here. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be back again with more cool stuff to show you. Um, but right now I think I've got enough to keep me busy for the rest of the summer and beyond. So um, thanks for being here. Uh, if you want uh, to see what I'm up to, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Just take a look for Angela Fair Artist. Uh, you can also uh, visit my website, angelafair.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like this video if you, if you felt a little inspired to use your own art supplies. Uh, I, have, uh, I do try to share things that will help you stay encouraged where you're at as an artist. The goal is to be the artist you were meant to be, uh, not a clone of me or any other uh, mentor that you have, but just to find your way to do things. And to me, that's the most rewarding way to teach. So thanks for being here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm going to hit the end stream now. So uh, thanks for watching. Bye for now.